Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And when they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Turn to your neighbor and ask them this question, where are you? God bless you. You may be seated. Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name. Every anniversary of the September 11th attack, a man by the name of Stanley Pramuth stands in a different church in a different city somewhere in America tells his story. This, he said, is how he answers God's call him when that huge passenger jet plowed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. He was the only known survivor that survived the impact of the jet on that very floor that it plowed into. Flight 175 shook the South Tower. As a matter of fact, one had already crashed into the tower across the way, and most of his colleagues and office mates were looking out of the glass at the destruction and havoc wrought by the first crash when the second one came right to where he was. Fortunately, he wasn't there peering through the window, but he was at his desk and managed to crawl under and to hold on for dear life as a blast of a fiery wind rushed through that office complex, and somehow he managed to emerge alive. After he got down, he fixed up a box, and on the box he called, he entitled the outside of the box Deliverance. And inside that box was the one shoe that he desperately depended upon to hobble down those many, many flights of steps. And the glass from the broken shards of windows was still implanted in the soles of that one shoe as he hopped his way down to safety. The only living survivor that we know of that was on the very floor where Flight 175 came into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. He was saved by a flashlight and a shoe. This man was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in the worst place on planet Earth at that time. But somehow, because of a flashlight and a shoe and a determined will and no doubt the grace of God, he made it to safety. The story that I read to you this morning in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were in the safest place. Not the safest place in town. Not the safest place in America. Not the safest place in the Middle East. But the safest place in the universe. 
and from the safest place in the universe, surrounded by the glory of God and by a relationship with the Almighty and by trees and fruits and garden designed to sustain them, somehow they lost it all. Where are you this morning? Where have you come from? Can I say this? And this is not to slight one and to praise the other. But there are people in this auditorium this morning, like Stanley, who came out of the impact zone. You have been delivered from some of the most dangerous places on the planet. Some of you have been delivered from drug addiction. Some have you, uh, have you, you have been delivered from familial abuse. Others of you have come out of gang type groups or come out of deep psychological and spiritual woundedness and hurt. And you're here today with your hands lifted, with your voices raised, <laughs> clapping and shouting and praising. Can I tell you about a God today that's not afraid to walk with you, not walk you through the valley of the shadow of death, but to walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. And all the cancer survivors say amen. And all the former alcoholics say amen. And all the ex-cons say amen. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about a God, amen, who rescued you from the very clutches of danger. And you're here celebrating today. Some of you have been rescued from the impact zone. Others of you have been rescued from the safety zone. Thank God for family. If you have been privileged to be insulated with loved ones who have raised you to serve and honor God, you have a testimony. If you think for one minute you got to become a bad guy or a bad girl in order to have a testimony worth listening to, I want to tell you something. If you've been raised in the house of God and have served the Lord all the days of your life, you ought to shout right alongside the ex-drug addict. Our kids hosted a party for Nicole and Devin uh, last night at their place, and I chuckled as Savannah, they brought out that fancy sparkling, uh, sparkling soda, and it looks like a champagne bottle, but it's not. And it had to have the cap that you have to take off. It wasn't a screw-off cap. It was a bottle opener cap, and Savannah had the bottle opener, and she tried to put it, and the minute she tried to place it on the bottle, I knew she'd never used one of these before. <laughs> and in my heart, I said, thank God she didn't. <laughs> you don't have to know how to roll a joint. You don't have to know how to cook a spoonful of crack. You don't have to know what it's like to do time to have a testimony. Welcome to a safe place where people, amen, can celebrate the goodness of God for keeping you away from troubles. The first Adam hid himself. He hid himself, I, and the Lord had to ask him, where are you? Sometimes we hide ourselves from God over the things that we never experienced. Adam never had a childhood. You think it was bad being a kid? How would you like to just pop into existence already fully mature, married, How would you like to not even know who you are yet? And all of a sudden, you're responsible for somebody else that you don't know who they are yet. I want, I want to preach.
to somebody who the devil has stolen your childhood. I want to speak to someone who's had to undergo the deep psychological scars that go along with having been expected to grow up far too soon. I want to talk to somebody who was expected to know what to do when you were never taught what to do. Because the people that brought you in the world didn't care enough to take the time to show you what to do. Somebody in this room was brought into this world by child adults. In other words, maybe your mama or your daddy or both of them weren't fully grown up themselves and didn't have an understanding of how to nurture and how to train and how to love. Maybe they didn't know you don't call little children names. That when you insult and belittle a young human being, you place deep and sometimes almost irreparable scars in their subconscious mind. But I want to announce to someone who is hurting today because you were never permitted to cry. You couldn't ask for help because you didn't know where your help would come from. You can't trust anyone as an adult because uh, you couldn't trust anyone as a child. And so you hide. And so I want to speak to you this morning and say God's going to bring you out. That you can come out. You can come out from wherever you are. And the Lord is in this place to restore the years that the canker worm has eaten and to bring back, amen, what you thought was gone for good. It's not gone for good. Come out. Come into his presence. Trust his grace. Trust the name of Jesus. And let a miracle of restoration of personhood take place today. Let's lift our hands right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We pray. Let's pray right now that God, God will restore the years to someone whose life's been wrecked. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for your miraculous presence, for the power of God that's in this place. In Jesus' name. When you hide from God, you hide from each other. Genesis 3 and 9, let me remind you, And the Lord called Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And Adam replied and said, I, everyone say I. I, I heard the voice of the Lord and, and I, everyone say I. I. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Look at the preponderance of the personal pronoun I. What happened to we? When we hide from God, we lose each other. When we hide from God, we don't care even about the people that we're directly responsible for. You cannot help yourself. You cannot help your neighbor. You cannot help your wife or your husband or your children if you're hiding from God. Somebody come out. Hallelujah. Somebody come out and find the Lord and the power of the Holy Ghost this morning. The five eyes of Adam are similar to the five eyes of Lucifer who said, I will ascend. I will come on the mountain. I will be like the Most High, etc., etc. Hallelujah. I can't afford to lose you. I'm coming out into the open before the presence of God and not being afraid to expose my sin and failure to Him so that I can have you. 2 Lee, it says in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 23 and 24, Therefore the Lord sent them forth out of the garden to till the ground from whence he was taken, and he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim, somebody say angels, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. 
if we hide from God, we lose each other and we lose the angels. Oh, hallelujah. I, I, come on, I, I cannot say goodbye to glory. As a matter of fact, I'm here to welcome the glory. If I'll come out in the open, wherever I am, whatever I've done, whoever I've been, then I have a chance at reestablishing the glory. But if I hide from God, I lose the angels. Somebody said farewell. This was going to be man's farewell to the cherubim. They would not show up again until Exodus chapter number 25, which was 2,500 years later. We don't have 2,500 years to get this together. We don't have 25 months to get it together. Lord, we don't even, shouldn't need more than 25 days to make this happen. Notice when the cherubim, when they, when they were, when they were, exiled from the garden they would never see mankind would never see the cherubim again until they appeared in the holy of holies on the covering of the ark on the mercy seat some 2500 years later my god hallelujah when you come out you get your life back and you get the glory of god back sardis Jesus said in Revelation chapter number 3 and verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and are dead. Somebody described the church of Sardis this way, and I quote, Outwardly splendid as of old, inwardly sparkless, void and cold. Her force and fire all spent and gone, like the dead moon she still shines on. Hallelujah. Don't let us become like the church of Sardis. Whatever it takes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whatever we got to do to get there, we can't afford to be dead and alive. At this. It's not enough just to have life. We need to have abundant life. We need to have an anointed life. We need to have a life. There needs to be a life force in the church that draws, amen, hungry people out of the world they're living in and brings them in to the glorious kingdom of light. Can somebody say we need revival? We need revival. Egypt, Greece, Gr e Egypt, Greece, and Rome, all three of them were glorious kingdoms. Now all they are is tourist traps. Thank God we live in the greatest nation on planet earth because this people has a heart to embrace the word of God. Praise unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in the name of Jesus, I believe that if we'll come out, if we'll come out from wherever we are and get a hold of God, America can be revived. God forbid that America doesn't become a tourist trap but it becomes a generator of Holy Ghost anointing and worldwide revival and apostolic power in the name of Jesus. We're coming out of it. We're coming out. We're coming out into the light. We're coming out into the glory. We're going to get each other back. We're going to get revival back. We're going to get the glory back. We're going to get the angels back. We're going to get the gifts of the Spirit back in the name of Jesus. Somebody put your hands together. When you hide from God, you hide from yourself. When you lose God, you lose yourself. And when you lose yourself, you hold yourself in shame and guilt and brokenness.
There are four men and four trees in the Bible that I'd like to remind you of. Adam ran and hid himself and Eve amongst the trees of the garden. Four men and four trees. Adam is the man that's the hiding man behind the tree. He's hiding behind the tree because he feels the load of his guilt and of his shame. You know the beauty of this church right here? You don't have to pretend to be somebody. Matter of fact, you don't have to pretend about anything at all. You can be who you are. You can come broken. You can come messed up. You can come defeated. You can come overloaded. You can come hopeless and friendless and all by yourself. And it won't be but one service. You won't be alone from that day forward because there's going to be a host of brothers and sisters who will pray for you and lift you up and befriend you and stand by you and believe. I need a church that not just believes in Jesus, but I need a church that believes in people. Can I tell you something? We believe in you. We believe you can come out of your trouble. We believe you can get bit better and not bitter. We believe that you can become a spiritual powerhouse in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, if you believe that's for anybody and everybody, would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Zacchaeus is the climbing man. He climbed a tree because of his stature. He was unable to compete with the crowd. The crowd was head and shoulders above him. He was lost in the crowd. He felt like he was a nobody. But he discovered that there are no nobodies when it comes to Jesus. Jesus spotted a short man in a tree and says, I want you to come down because I'm going home with you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody may have walked through this doors today thinking, I don't even know what I'm doing here. But before it's all over, you're not going to leave by yourself. You're taking Jesus home with you. You're taking the power of mercy and forgiveness home with you. You're taking a new life back out of these doors in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because I feel this in my spirit. God is going to restore your joy and your hope. And the years that the enemy has devoured in the name. And he's going to make you like a child again in Jesus' name. You're going to skip and dance and sing for no reason. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There was a man under a tree. There's a man behind a tree, a man in a tree, a man under a tree. Elijah was the running man, and he was running from a spirit. <laughs> Have you ever had to run from a spirit? The Bible says, when I say run from a spirit, I don't mean actually run like a coward from a spirit. I mean have to do battle with a spirit. If you've never had to do battle with a spirit, you've never presented very much of a threat to the kingdom of darkness. I'm telling you, sometimes you come right in the doors of the house of God and a spirit will follow you right in here. Sit on your shoulder. Tell you you're not worthy to shout and worship God. Other people can, but not you. God loves that one and that one and that one and this one, but not me. The devil is a liar. I said the devil is a liar. You need to challenge him with the word of God. Try the spirits to see whether they be of God because there's many false voices that have gone out in the world. If there's a voice in the time of worship that tells you shut up and sit down, it's a lie. If there's a voice that tells you you're too bad and too evil to find Jesus, it's a lie. If there's a voice that tells you nobody in the church loves you, it's a lie. Hallelujah. 
Come on, somebody. The devil is a liar. Don't run from the spirits of the evil one. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is what I feel like. I feel like somebody came in here running from the enemy, but that's the, it's the, going to be the other way around. It's the devil that's supposed to run from you. From this day forward, I'm not running from the devil. The devil is going to be running from me. Resist the devil and he will flee. Come on, send up some praise right now. Kick the enemy out of your life. In the name, send him to running. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Precious God, in Jesus' name. There's a man behind a tree, a man in a tree, a man under the tree. And there's the man on the tree. The Bible recognizes two men in a way that it recognizes no other. One is Adam. The other is the second Adam, Jesus. One ate from the tree and died. The other died on the tree and lived. I want to preach to you about that man on that tree. Adam ate from a tree and died and then transferred the curse of death to all of his descendants. Jesus was hung on a tree and died on a tree and lived and transferred that life. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. Jesus transferred blessing. Adam transferred curse. And for as by one man's sins, disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. In the Old Testament, this is the way it worked. Uncleanliness was communicable. Priests transferred their sins to the things that were unblemished. Notice when the priest would offer a bullock, they would tie it to the altar and the priest would lay hands on it. Or when they released the scapegoat, the priest would put his hands on the goat to do what? To transfer his sins and the sins of the nation to the goat and then set it free. That's why you couldn't, anyone unclean couldn't touch a priest in the Old Testament. That's why a priest couldn't walk on a, on a grave site or couldn't become contaminated in any way. Kind of like the coronavirus. It's everywhere. It's stalking you. You got to be careful. Everything you touch. And I'm not mocking. I've had friends that have been, that have been taken out because of it, okay? But, but sin was like that in the Old Testament. Uncleanliness was transferred from one to the other. But in the New Testament, because of the man on the tree, everything was reversed. Jesus transferred. See, Adam transferred his fallen nature. And in that fallen nature, we transferred to each other. But Jesus comes in and turns it all around. And now he transfers divine nature. Imagine this. Say a 30-year-old man. Let's say he's been married a few years. Let's say he's working his farm in the daytime and building their dream house at night. Maybe he's got a lovely wife, two small children, and say another on the way. He comes home from work. He notices there's a sore on his hand. He shows it to his wife. It doesn't seem like much and it doesn't hurt. And so he waits, takes a few days off, thinking it'll go away. It grows. It grows some more. 
It develops white around the edges. They become concerned. Still doesn't hurt. So they go to the, to the person designated to diagnose. And he looks at the sore. And he says, I want you to stay here for a few weeks. We're going to watch it and see what happens. It gets larger and larger. Suddenly, it's diagnosed as leprosy. And here's a man with children, a wife, a family, a farm, and he's told, you can't go home. You're going to have to go from here to the leper colony. But I love my children. I want to see them grow up. If you want to see them grow up, go to the leper colony. Because if you even so much as touch one of them, it could communicate that to them. And they could meet the same fate that you have. And so there, having the sentence upon him, he'd never be able to come home again. I want you to watch as his broken-hearted wife brings some food somewhere near the place where her husband is staying and dying. Puts some food on a rock and he rushes out there and he gobbles it up. Maybe sometimes she brings the kids so he can see them from afar, but never get close enough to touch them or hug them, much less kiss them. And as this disease progresses further and further, he loses an ear, he loses a nose, he loses fingertips. He finally tells his family, just stay away. Not because he doesn't want to see them. He doesn't want them to see him. And about that time, he hears of a man named Jesus. And somebody said, there's a man named Jesus nearby. And folks say that he could heal every kind of sickness. And the duty of the leprous man was to call out in warning anyone who would approach, leper! He was to dress in rags. He was to cover his face. He was to scream in public, leper! Leper! And as Jesus' team got closer, he began to do what the law expected him to do. Leper! Leper! And Jesus' men fell back but Jesus kept on coming. I said, Jesus kept on coming. I said, Jesus will keep on coming. I said, when Jesus got you in your sight, you can't be bad enough, sick enough, sinful enough, wounded enough, evil enough to stop him. And he cried out, leper, leper. And Jesus reached out his hand and did the unthinkable. He touched that man with leprosy. And virtue flowed out of Jesus and reversed the curse. Everything is different now because a man hung on a cross. You can come out. You can come out, and whatever has got no hold of you, whatever's killing you, one touch from the hand of the master can bring healing and virtue. I want us to stand and lift our hands right now. There's a healer here. There's a healer in this house today. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, before I open these altars, I want to say one last thing. Jesus demonstrated over and over he could heal at a distance. Jesus could have healed a man from 50 paces, but he needed to touch this one. Because of all the brokenness on the inside, that man needed to know that he was loved. And I just want to say to somebody who feels like you've lost a good part of your life by whatever reason, the arms of the Lord want to wrap themselves around you. Not only does he want to take away your sin and burdens, but he wants you to know you're lovable. You are lovable in the name of Jesus. These altars are open. Would you come and get a touch? Would you come and get a touch?
Would you come and bring your brokenness? Bring your hurt and your sorrow and your failures in the name of Jesus. Do you need a touch? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, you can't keep God away. You can't keep God away from what's hurting. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I feel there's a healer here. Hallelujah. Almighty God, in the name of Jesus. Almighty God, in the name of Jesus. He's coming your way. Oh, Ramaha. He's coming your way. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Touch somebody. Touch them. Virtue. I just see virtue like a river flowing right out of the hand of God. Just pouring through you like an electric current. In the name of Jesus.